We have over 200 attendees joining us for today's event um, from all sorts of different communities. We're so glad that all of you have joined us. Um, we have alumni, we have professionals in uh, the local community here. We have um, many staff from Ohio State and some surprises, some people we don't know anything about. So thank you again for joining. Uh, we are marking the end of Pride Month by exploring Ohio State's LGBTQ archives, which are housed at the University Libraries. For those of you who may not know, University Libraries is here to support students, scholars, Buckeyes, and beyond, advancing research, teaching, and learning. We offer educational resources, services, and expertise that opens minds and forwards equity, inclusion, and diversity in the pursuit and sharing of knowledge. So joining us for today's conversation is one of my very favorite people in the whole world, Brett Shingledecker. Brett is our founding donor of this remarkable collection that we're going to talk about today. And all of us at University Libraries, I know I can say this on behalf of all of us, we're so grateful, Brett, for your friendship and your partnership with us. Um, Brett is an Ohio native raised in Lima. He opened the first LGBTQ, LGBTQ bookstore in Chicago called People Like Us. Now, if you listen really carefully, there's just so much beauty in the name of that bookstore. Listen, people like us. People like us. Uh, so the collection does represent some of his time owning the bookstore and the community that brought, uh, that came along with it. So this collection is a remarkable resource for teaching, research, and for community information and service. We will also hear from Eric Johnson. He is our curator of Thompson Special Collections here at Ohio State. And he's going to help us to better understand the importance of preserving, protecting, and amplifying stories from the LGBTQ community for students to learn from in the classroom, for researchers from across the globe to explore, and to support the university's education and outreach missions that are in alignment with our land grant mission. So we, we spoke before we, uh, you know, joined this meeting, um, the panelists here, and we know that this year's Pride activities, they feel a little different this year, maybe a little less celebratory um, than in recent years, no large gatherings. Um, and of course, so many of us have noticed the parallels between the 1969 Stonewall riots and the connection to the gay liberation movement to today's Black Lives Matter movement in protests of police brutality and racism. That isn't going to be the primary focus for today's conversation, but we do recognize the similarities of both movements. So just a couple quick reminders here. Today's uh, session will be recorded. All participants have been muted. So if you have any questions and we welcome them, we hope that you submit them to the Q&A box that you see. Um, the chat can be used for general comments and discussions. So I'll be scanning that Q&A box in particular for anything that you'd like to ask our panelists. Today's session is being recorded for future viewing. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome our main guest, Brett Shingledecker. Hello, Brett. Hi, Julie. Thank you. And thank sure. you, everybody, for spending your afternoon with us. I want to thank you, too, Julie, for particularly pointing out people like us books and the, the two meanings for the name. Not a lot of people always catch that. And sometimes, People who shopped the store on a regular basis would come in years after the fact and say, I just got today the fact that your name has two meanings. So I'm glad that you pointed that out. Oh, Brett, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself in your early years growing up in Ohio. We'd love to hear about your background. Well, sure. I was born and raised in Lima, Ohio. Uh, which is I call home today, a population of about 30,000 people. And I came out of the closet uh, as a gay man at a time when that wasn't something that was really the norm. Uh, in fact, uh, my generation, uh, you came up in a world where the words gay or lesbian were never mentioned in polite society. There was no such thing as any reference to uh, gay on television or in movies, let alone any positive imagery. I was always sort of whispered under the breath if somebody was thought to be gay. It was a lot of shame and a lot of embarrassment. So this is the environment that I uh, grew up in, not only in Lima, but it was culturally throughout the United States and arguably the globe at that time. 
And at the ripe old age of 15, I came out of the closet, uh, which was 1978. I was attending a, a Catholic high school here in Lima, Ohio. And I feel very blessed that I have a family who has been very supportive and very, very um, welcoming, uh, which isn't to say that there weren't challenges that uh, my mother, uh, specifically my grandparents and I, had many conversations that um, needed to happen as a part of the coming out process, but I really got uh, the support and the backing that I needed um, at a time where during a, a young person's development, I think it's really crucial. And so that was uh, the early years. I was uh, supported by my friends in high school, uh, those who I, I choose to come out to. And, you know, I was subject to bullying in high school. And I think that a lot of people who are bullied handle that in different ways. And if anything, I think that the bullying that I experienced throughout my school years, if anything, um, served to steal my resolve and to strengthen me as a person so that moving forward, I was able to make the choices that led to ultimately, I think, to uh, where I am today and, and having got me to the years that uh, led to opening up the bookstore. Well, we really just <laughs> dove in the deep end there. Um, I, I loved that you shared with us right away about your background and hopefully what we've just learned and what we were able to hear from you just helps us to understand who you were um, when you opened up the first LGBTQ bookstore in Chicago. So talk a little bit about your journey there and um, talk broadly about what you think that LGBTQ books or meant to the community. Well, um, getting to the bookstore, I'll say that uh, I actually am not an alum of Ohio State. I went to the George Washington University in Washington, DC, and I had the good fortune, uh, having gone to school in the District of Columbia, to visit a bookstore there uh, which was called Lambda Rising. Uh, it was owned by uh, two men who ultimately married uh, Deacon McCubbin and his husband, Jim. And it was the LGBT bookstore for the Washington DC community. And this was such a haven to me. I was a child who always revered books and looked to books not only for escape and for fantasy, but also for education and for furthering my knowledge of things that were beyond my realm. So to find a place in Washington that let me discover my community and, and who I was as a person was a real revelation. So moving forward post-graduation when I wound up in Chicago, Illinois, I had uh, the good fortune of sharing an office with a, a woman, Carrie Barnett, who um, was, is a lesbian. She and I became very good friends and we together decided to open the first LGBT bookstore in Chicago. And it's fairly unique in that to my knowledge to even this day, I think we're one of the only LGBTQ businesses that ever existed that was co-owned both by a gay man and by a lesbian. And it was, it was a real privilege for both of us to be able to serve the community in the manner that we did and to be the resource that we were to not only Chicagoans, but to the greater community at large. People would come to visit us from other cities and they would uh, drop by the store to learn about what was happening in the community. I always felt that we were one of three things. First and foremost, we were booksellers. And obviously that was the, the main goal, but I think we were equally concierges to the community at large. People were seeking our uh, advice, input on where to go, what to do during their time in Chicago, what community events were happening. And we were also one third counselors, really. And the number of times that people would come into the shop and uh, one young man comes to mind who said to us, you know, 
I've driven past your bookstore every day for the past month, but today was the first day that I was able to summon up the strength to come through the door to get information about coming out. That's powerful. And to know that we as booksellers are able to then guide him to a section of literature on either coming out stories or what it means to be gay um, is very powerful and very moving to know that we can impact lives in that way. And this was the days before internet, so you couldn't Google to find information. Can you talk, talk a little bit about the importance of information and people along their journeys who would come to the bookstore before, you know, maybe you could find online communities of support? Sure. You know, the time was different then. The, the shop opened in 1988 and it existed until 1997. We saw a lot of change during that particular time, both in the LGBTQ community, but in the world at large, most notably the advent of the internet and online buying. But at the time that the shop opened, you couldn't go into a general bookstore and find a shelf that was marked gay studies or lesbian studies. They really were not in existence with maybe few exceptions. And of course you couldn't go online to learn about your community or find out any information about LGBTQ literature or events that were happening. So bookstores such as ours, and they did exist across the nation and the world. Sadly, many of them have now closed with the advent of the internet. But um, at that particular time in history, we were the community center. We were the place where you would go to learn about what was happening and to pick up the latest books, musics, periodicals, what have you, to uh, further your education, further your knowledge, maybe get some escapist reading. Uh, all of the material in the shop was either um, written by somebody in the LGBTQ community or it had LGBTQ content. That was our criteria for what materials we carried in the bookstore. Great, and Brett, we have a question that has come through the chat here um, from Tom Reeves. He says, I love your description as the bookstore being sort of an ambassador of the LGBTQ community. And uh, Tom says, I certainly used to look for gay bookstores when traveling with Amazon's rise and the closing of so many bookstores. Have you seen anything like that to replace it? Oh, well, thanks for the question, Tom. Um, and unfortunately, that answer is no, I, I really haven't. And I do from time to time read about uh, other bookstore closings. Uh, most of them, if not all of them, have closed now. There are one or two exceptions. I don't see those physical spaces being replaced by anything uh, in our community right now. Uh, the way that uh, we used to meet, you know, you'd go out to a gay bar, you'd meet friends for a drink. Um, maybe you'd go out to make the acquaintance of a gentleman, um, find romance. Uh, dating happened in that environment. The bar situation has changed. Now so much of that's done through apps. I think that it's almost one of the reasons why it's so important that this information has a home at a place like The Ohio State University and that people could come together and have access to that information in one place through the library systems now. So I would argue that really one of the best resources in this day and age are the libraries throughout uh, the country. So thank goodness that OSU not only exists, but was willing to uh, take in my collection. Thank goodness. Brett, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to know our curator, Eric Johnson, and why did your collection end up here at Ohio State? You mentioned you're not one of our alumni, so tell us about that journey. So, as I had the bookshop and Carrie and I would host various authors in the bookstore on a, on a regular basis, uh, both she and I individually amassed a fairly large signed first edition collection of literature that was specific to the community. And I have always been a bibliophile. I've always loved the, the physical book, the smell of a book, the touch of a book in your hands. I, 
I think the Kindles and, and readers, e-readers are excellent, but replace the physicality of a book. And for other bibliophiles out there, you know what I'm talking about when I say that. You can kind of see behind me my own personal collection here at home. And that's been important to me since childhood. So I've always saved books that have been important to me, uh, whatever their topic. And as you can imagine, as a member of the LGBTQ community, I've saved a number of books and other things specific to our community throughout the years. And as after 1997, when the bookstore closed, and over the time that passed, I realized that the material that I was in possession of was increasingly becoming historically significant. And I thought that it would be very important that it find a home where it could be preserved and also accessed for study. And so to that end, I actually talked to a number of universities around the country, uh, my alma mater, a number of other universities. Nobody seemed particularly interested. And I reached out to The Ohio State University and spoke with Eric Johnson, who was at the time the curator of rare books and manuscripts. And Eric was beyond enthusiastic about what I was in possession of. He was excited about the literature that I had. He was excited about the prospect of it finding a home at OSU. And to me, this was such a no brainer because here was somebody who I knew right from the get-go that he wanted to preserve the material and he was going to revere it in the same way that, that I revere that material. So I had an ally in Eric right from the start. Well, let's um, let Eric introduce himself here. Um, Eric, tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at University Libraries and what was going through your head when Brett reached out to you. Okay, well, at first glance, uh, well, first of all, thanks to all the folks behind the scenes at OSUL who really put this together. Um, this is definitely not something I would have been able to facilitate myself. So I'm, I'm really, really grateful to all my colleagues at OSUL for helping with this. Um, but ab about myself, um, I'm probably not really, after you hear about my background, the likeliest person to be incredibly enthusiastic and, and embrace um, a modern collection like this. Um, the reason for that is, um, Academically and by uh, professional training, I'm a curator who is very much a pre-modern manuscript specialist um, at OS Order of Thompson Special Collections. And that's a, an administrative section in the university libraries that combines three different special collections units. Uh, those are the Hillandar Research Library, which is the world's largest collection of medieval Slavic Cyrillic manuscripts on microform. Um, the Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee Theater Research Institute Library and the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library. And for those three units, um, I kind of coordinate and oversee um, instructional services, collections, public outreach, things like that. More specifically, though, I am the lead curator for the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library. And my specific subject expertise, as I mentioned before, is in pre-modern materials. I have a Master of Library and Information Science and then an MA and a PhD in Medieval Studies. And my own research really focuses on the world of medieval manuscripts. Having said all of that, however, I am deeply, deeply passionate about the power of rare books, manuscripts, special collections, materials at large and in general um, to really radically impact the way that university students, K through 12 students, interested members of the community um, go about the process of learning, learning about themselves, learning about um, our own culture, our own society, learning about past cultures and societies. And there really almost is not a better tool to do this with than through physical books, physical manuscripts, and the different ways that information has been packaged and processed in the past, and the different types of messages that um, have been packaged in various formats throughout time. So although I'm an early person by background, academically speaking, I'm deeply invested in the idea of the larger continuum of information processing and how ideas have come down to us and Brett's collection when he approached me was an immediate hit for me because here was an area that Ohio State really didn't collect in yet in any sort of systematic way um, like most big special collections departments around the country around the world we likely had quite a few things um, 
related to LGBTQ studies, but they would have come into the collection through a process that I always um, liken to uh, the incredibly destructive process of gill net fishing, where you have you know a giant fishing boat with a mile long gill net trailing behind it, where maybe you're after tuna, but you actually gather all sorts of other things by accident. So we have tons of things in our collections that have just kind of accrued by accident without any sort of deliberate curation behind them. Um, Brett's collection allowed us to really overnight have a substantial, incredibly useful collection in LGBTQ studies. Um, so that was a, a big attraction for, for me for bringing it to Ohio State, but also Brett's phone call came at a time when the university itself um, was actually reconceptualizing the way um, that they approach gender and sexuality studies instruction and research. Um, there's a relatively new department that's been in place now for about a decade, maybe a little bit longer, or program. Um, and that really kind of got up and running right around the time that Brett's collection came in. And as a curator, one of my big goals, obviously, is not just to collect. Um, Having books and manuscripts in your collection, it means nothing if you're not actually going to use them, if you're not actually going to get them in people's hands. And knowing that the Gender and Sexuality Studies program was getting up and running at OSU, there was this perfect opportunity, this perfect synergy. Here's a collection that we can begin to start uh, promoting in active ways for faculty research, for visiting researchers to come in, for students to come in and engage with and learn about LGBTQ history and culture and society in the United States directly from incredibly rare materials um, that often didn't survive because of their ephemeral nature. So really, you know, you no, know, for me, it was opportunity. It was um, really a way to develop a whole new collection for Ohio State that captures diverse voices, but also as a curator, you're constantly looking for ways to reconceptualize the collections you already have and to draw connections between those collections and other things that resonate with student, students and researchers. And so Brett's collection has also allowed um, myself and my colleagues over time to really think about how different parts of our collections really do connect to each other through the different kinds of materials that, that what Brett collected um, has brought to Ohio State. Very exciting. I know you've spoken pretty broadly about why this collection felt important. Um, do you have one or two things that you'd like to share early on that you got so excited about? You talked about eph ephemera that um, you know, might not be in existence anymore if it hadn't been preserved. Um, and one of the questions that came through, um, maybe you can touch on Eric, um, really great discussion about bookstores and communities. Can we talk a little bit about the history of queer periodicals and printed circulation in this era of the bookstore and maybe some of the other material that you as a curator thought was really important in this collection? Well, let's see, my curator, Jolie Brown, um, she is our modern curator and she teaches uh, a lot out of this collection with exactly this sort of material. One, one of the areas, and Brett, please feel free to jump in, considering you're the one who collected this and you were the one who was selling these things back in the 80s and 90s, but one of the most valuable components of our collection is the queer zines component of this collection. Um, this is material that is really kind of on the street material. This is straight from the heart material. This is self-published material that um, is of import to the person who is putting it together through old-fashioned cut and paste methods using a Xerox machine, um, running off 10 copies, 20 copies, whatever it is, and sending them off into the void waiting to be heard. Um, these are the kinds of things that don't necessarily survive in any sort of great numbers. And if they are out there as a curator, it can be incredibly difficult to try to track this material down. Um, I was interested, I've been interested in amateur press and small press and zine things um, most of my life. I've been a, a magazine and comic book collector and things like that since I was a little kid. Um, so I was very enthusiastic about that component of the collection, but the very first, um, kind of formal teaching interaction that Brett and I had with this collection and an OSU course really hammered home how important that kind of material is. Um, we joined forces to introduce zine materials from the Shingledecker collection into, uh, I think the course was titled something like Introduction to Queer Theory. Um, it was the very first queer theory course ever taught at the Ohio, uh, the Ohio State Lima campus. 
And Brett went up, he gave a talk, um, gave some of his background and talked about the collection. And um, we took up a selection of these zines for students to work with. And as they were looking at them after Brett's um, address, I circulated amongst the students and just engaged them in conversation, asked them what was really resonating with them, uh, what they thought of this material and getting the chance to use it. And this one young woman in the course, she was really visibly flustered. She was emotional. Um, wasn't quite sure why. I asked her that, that why she was enthusiastic about this or what was resonating with her and she ran to her desk um, and picked up the course reader that they had and she, showed me this article in it where, I forget the name of the zine it was referring to, but in this article, it talks about a particular zine and there's a footnote that says, no known copies of this zine are known to exist. Um, the information here comes from, you know, personal correspondence with people, et cetera, et cetera. And she points this out to me, walks over to one of the desks that has zines on it and says, here's the zine. And, it was an amazing palpable moment to see not just the general power of special collections materials and primary source materials to resonate with students, but especially within this context where LGBTQ history and materials um, by accident, by deliberate action have been hidden, um, have been downplayed, have been marginalized throughout the history of academic um, discourse and exploration, and very, very, very much so through the history of kind of institutional collecting. It's been an area that has historically been overlooked, and to see this student really come to grips in a palpable way with um, this incredibly rare artifact. And here it is, just, you know, modern paper. It was from the late 1980s. It's not the kind of thing that as a rare books curator we're, we're necessarily trained to think about as being rare or valuable or special in the way that say a, an illuminated manuscript is or a first edition of Shakespeare. But here it was talking to a student, speaking to a student in deeply meaningful ways. It was very, very impactful. Eric, I'm wow. going to jump in there and I will be talking about uh, zines in just a little bit, but specific to the question that was posed about periodicals, um, a large part of the collection that I've given to the university uh, are periodicals. Uh, in addition to other, what we call ephemera and realia, t-shirts, buttons, pins, posters, things that were specific to the community, but specific to periodicals. I think it's important to note that even pre-zines, that in the early part of the movement, in the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, when it would have cost you your job to have published something and tried to disseminate it to members of your, your community, or even having your name associated with homosexuality in the newspaper would have led to social ruin. A lot of materials, a lot of information that was put forth at that time was uh, chapbooks, flyers, things that were able to be mailed directly to people but not necessarily published for for the public at large and the fact that we've been able to save some of this material i'm thinking particularly a, a lot of um uh, the magazines they're called magazines but they're really just these little chapbooks uh with the title one o-n-e one that really date to uh, the early 60s, uh, specific to our community, were, were really kind of underground. And they were able to share with LGBTQ members of the community at that time what was happening legally, if anything, who was being arrested and why, how you could, how you should comport yourself, what to do if you were confronted by the police. So they were really important and I'm glad that we were able to save some of those from uh, uh, the earlier okay, I'm going to ask you to share some um, images here in a minute but before we get there can you talk about in the moment were you aware of the historical importance of this material and what was going on in your head when you to this and you hung on to it for years before it found its home what was that like for you to be honest, I don't think in the moment when I had the bookshop that it ever really occurred to me that my personal books would be part of something greater in the future. 
Uh, as I said earlier, as a bibliophile, I've always collected books. I take great comfort in having books around me. Um, I really revere the power of the book. And so the fact that I saved what I did is by virtue of the nature of who I am as a person. And I did save all that material. And as time progressed, it slowly dawned on me that we lived through such an important historical time from 1988 through 1997 with uh, dealing with the AIDS crisis in our community, dealing with organizations like ACT UP and Queer Nation, coming to terms with um, pushing for LGBTQ gay uh, rights in the early years. Um, all of this led me to believe that this needs to find a home for future generations. There were three components that I thought were really important with what I had. Number one, that whoever took it in was going to be able to preserve it, to keep it as it, as it is. Some of the zines in particular are very fragile. Some of them are printed on unusual material. And so preservation was important. Number two, that it would have uh, a, a place where it could be shared in an educational institution uh, to anybody who needed to access this information uh, to find out about what happened in a particular place and time in our history. But number three, that it would also lay the foundation so that other people could donate their works to the library. I encourage people to reach out to The Ohio State University if you have LGBTQ material, particularly if it's of historic significance, and you're wondering, what am I going to do with this? This is certainly a way that it could find a permanent home knowing that it's going to be cherished, taken care of, and studied for future generations. Well, Brett, here we're going to pull up your slideshow. Um, what I want to share with the audience is you, you've noticed, of course, that we're doing this virtually. We haven't had access to the collection during the COVID crisis. So what the images that you're going to see are photos that some of our staff and faculty at the libraries actually took on their own personal cell phones because we love this collection so much so we wish that we had even more rich visual images to share with you but this will um, just give a few visual aids for Brett uh, to talk about that's within the collection but we do wish that more of this uh, collection was digitized of course when we are able to safely resume more face-to-face -face interactions we invite everyone on this webinar and your friends to come see the collection in person so just wanted to share that uh, we wish we had more to share with you um, but Brett walk us through um, a little bit more about what's in the collection with these images sure I have picked a couple of images to share and I'll state that I really haven't picked books images of books, I should say, to share with you, that's probably the bulk of the collection. I've probably given the university approximately a thousand books, many of them signed first editions, and I believe that there's going to be a link later in the, in the chat field that can link you to the OSU Shingledecker collection, to the archive itself, so that you could peruse, see what is uh, available there. But I've chosen some images that I think um, are a little bit um, of a broader category. And I'm starting with an image here of uh, there I am on the right with Carrie Barnett, the woman I co-owned the bookstore with. And Carrie, who is really one of my very dearest friends to this day, what a blessing it was to have her uh, in partnership with uh, this bookstore. She had attained her MBA and was pursuing a career track in theater management when she and I met. And we had so much fun together sharing that office during my temp time uh, in the office with her. Her assistant was away on maternity leave and I was filling in for a few months. And we enjoyed each other's company so much, I literally convinced her to leave her job and to co-found this LGBTQ bookstore uh, with me. 
And there you see a logo that was our People Like Us Books logo, which uh, both of us were very proud of. And we are at the Harold Washington Library in Chicago, Illinois. This was after uh, the bookstore was inducted into the Chicago LGBTQ Hall of Fame in 2017. Um, it was uh, inducted uh, institutionally uh, and Carrie and I were in attendance and as a part of the Pride Month celebration, the main library in Chicago, the Harold Washington Library, which is a beautiful library if ever you have an opportunity to visit it in Chicago, did a display of all of the new inductees for the Hall of Fame that year. So Carrie and I went down to the library and, and here we are with uh, a picture of the logo and then next to us is a little information about um, the achievement of the bookstore for the community at that time. We can have a look at the next slide. Oh my, there's me at a much younger age with Quentin Crisp. And we're at the bookstore. You can see I've got the pride flag behind me and one of our t-shirts uh, uh, on the wall. Quentin Crisp, nobody was like Quentin Crisp. I think this picture dates to 1992. And if you really want to treat, you could read his book, from 1968, uh, his autobiography called The Naked Civil Servant, or if you prefer, you could rent the movie The Naked Civil Servant, which starred John Hurt. Uh, that dates to 1975. And it's about Quentin's early years about being an unapologetically gay man in England back in the 30s and the 40s at a time where you can only imagine how difficult it must have been and here is a man who chose to dye his hair lavender, as you can see, I actually think it was tinted pink when he was visiting us in the shop. And he was the most charming, engaging man, wound up living in New York City for many, many years, had his name published in the phone book. You could literally pick up a phone book, call Quentin on the phone um, if you wanted to, you would be more than happy to go to dinner with you, provided you were going to pick up the tab. Um, he really made a living being a raconteur and being this sort of larger than life person. And we're behind the counter of the bookstore in this picture. And just out of the picture is actually the computer that we used at the bookstore uh, for point of sale and, and tracking. And I remember that he referred to it as the demon machine. So a very, He's a very old fashioned gentleman and a wonderful man to have uh, known in my lifetime. It was a privilege to have posted him at the bookstore. Okay, what do we have next? Ah, I was counted. This is a sticker. I actually wore this sticker on my shirt on April 25th, 1993, when I attended the March on Washington, which uh, at that time was the largest march in the history of Washington, D.C. They had one million people there that day and uh, quite the roster of speakers through the day. Uh, Melissa Etheridge spoke, Madonna was there, Leah Delaria was there, Sir Ian McKellen was there, Martina Navratilova spoke, uh, Irva Shivayid spoke that day. Really a very empowering uh, day. Uh, in Washington, D.C. And this is something that I like to point out that is such a unique thing that's a part of this collection. This is literally a sticker that was on my shirt. And for whatever reason, I saved it. And because of that, it now has a home and it will be preserved for posterity. So I like to point out that even little stickers got saved in my world. Okay, what's next? Oh, National Coming Out Day. So this is a t-shirt that I believe I wore on Oprah Winfrey's show in 1989. Um, the, the design itself was done by the famous street artist Keith Haring, who unfortunately we lost at a very early age to AIDS. Um, his work is always immediately recognizable as Haring. And uh, this shirt dates to 1989. You can see the date there, October 11th. 
And this was the second year of its inception. National Coming Out Day was created in 1988 as a way for people to be able to share with friends, allies, family members that you were gay or lesbian or queer, or however you choose to self-identify. It was about um, creating awareness, but also about building allegiance and alliances with our allies and uh, members who are not a part of our community. So uh, one of the t-shirts that I have donated to the collection is there. Okay, Outpunk. This is a zine and I love zines. I feel so fortunate that Eric and Jolie at the library feel the same way that I do about zines. Zine, by the way, is a term that is short for the word fanzine, F-A-N-Z-I-N-E, as in I am a fan of what is in this zine. And Outpunk was a very specific zine. Um, Matt Wobesmith published this particular zine, and it was for um, what we would call homo core musicians, queer core musicians, the really hardcore punk queer scene. And there was a big underground community of punk queer people who looked to zines like Out Punk and others like them to find out what bands were playing where or which member of a band was now playing with another member of a band. And this would have been something, as Eric said earlier, that as a zine would have been cut and paste. People would have taken pictures, taped them on uh, paper, stapled them, glued them together, gone to the copier, copied the images off, stapled them together, and then sold them for a dollar or two. And because I always was fascinated by zines and by um, the sort of radicalness of what is in so many of them, so many of them are fringe in their content and out there in what they are about, that they really just fascinated me as a person. And so I saved so many of them. And you can find a huge queer zine collection at OSU now. I'm gonna mention just a few titles of some of the zines that are housed at OSU that I've donated over the year, because I just even love the titles in and of themselves. Um, you have some copies of William Wants a Doll. You have some copies of Sin Brothers. You have some copies of Demure Butchness. And you have some copies of Better Homos and Gardens. So just a couple of the titles that um, might tickle your fancy and might um, spur you on to want to look into the collection a little bit. Oh, what fabulous titles of those zines there. Thank you for the overview of what's in the collection. Eric, I would love for you to help us that are not in the library world to understand, we understand now that the, the zines and the collection is safe at Ohio State, but how does one go about finding this material? And Nyla Bird in the chat asks, what was the thought process behind creating the finding aid, that tool we used to, to figure out what's in there? Are there any plans to make a more elaborate finding aid? So just how do people get connected to this information? So, well, the aforementioned finding aid, which is available online, I am not the person I will, although I am a curator, I am not an archival processor. So I cannot give you too much insight on um, that process. Um, generally, the place like Ohio State, I, to give due justice and credit to our processing team, they face a monumental task in dealing with collections like this, and not just like this, but the massive backlog of collections that we have um, at Ohio State that need description um, access. So the finding aids um, at this stage for the Shingle Decker collection are very, very helpful in allowing you to find particular items, but they're not necessarily what a lot of people expect in the current Google verse, where you can just in, input a, a, say, a keyword into Google and come up with a world's worth of information and potential hits. Um, but you will have complete um, records of titles, of zines, of correspondence. 
correspondence, brief descriptions of the kinds of correspondence that are in there, the business records that Brett had saved and contributed, um, all sorts of materials like that related to the archival holdings. Then on the other side of um, the collection, we have the published materials. All of those are cataloged and available with subject headings, keyword searching, et cetera, through the university library's catalog. Um, in order to help facilitate putting different books together because um, you know, obviously depending on their subject matter, they're gonna be shelved all over the place within the secure stacks, um, special collection stacks. But there's a um, collection level record that is the Brett Shingledecker LGBTQ collection and you can click on that link and it brings within the catalog, it brings up an entire list of all of the books that Brett donated but other acquisitions that we've made through the years either uh, through purchase or donation that have been added to that collection um, subsequently. Um, so finding aids through the special collections registry um, and I believe that link is going to be posted online um, or on the chat for you guys to take a look at and then I'm not sure if we had this link queued up to go but the catalog collection level link that's something that I'd be more than happy to provide to anyone who uh, wants to actually get a complete book list of everything that we Nyla, have. Thanks for the question so um, Eric is one of the most accessible curators I've ever come across so we encourage you from this day forward if you do have any of those questions about how to find material what to find uh, please reach out to Eric directly and we will be sharing his contact information here so Nyla, Thank you again for the question. So Eric, um, I've got a, maybe a big question, maybe a multi-part question for you. What are some of your dreams for the future of the LGBTQ collection? Um, why is the collection important to our student community here at Ohio State, researchers across the world, and, and the community at large? Tell us about the big dreams for this collection. Well, honestly, that's a completely different hour-long session. Um, <laughs> We'll try to touch on a couple of those things. Um, regarding the importance to teaching and research, um, I think we touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, some of the things Brett had said about the, why he saved things, um, the little tidbit of information he gave about the sticker. Um, our collection is full of little chance survivals like that, that, you know, a, a sticker like the one Brett showed is not war and peace in terms of like being a substantial piece of literature, but it's a powerful, powerful artifact of a very important moment in history. The collection is full of things like that that are just waiting to be discovered and interpreted and applied in different contexts. Um, the account I gave of that course up in Lima and that one student's response to seeing this zine, I think that is about the best example I've had really in my career are one of the best examples of special collections materials, why Brett's collection in particular is, is important. Um, Brett's collection is perpetually going to serve teaching, research, and um, kind of traditional outreach, uh, library outreach. What I mean by traditional outreach, you know, the occasional tour, the public outreach event, a little bit like this, where we can talk about the collection. Um, feeding exhibitions, whether they're Ohio State University exhibitions or in fact um, the Art After Stonewall National Traveling Exhibition that's, that's currently, you can't go and see it because of COVID, but it's currently at the Columbus Museum of Art. Um, they actually borrowed material from uh, Brett's collection for that and it's been to New York, Florida, and now here in Columbus. Those kinds of traditional activities are, are kind of part and parcel of what we do in special collections. But the reason I'm really incredibly excited about um, Brett's collection is the kind of non-traditional things that we might be able to do with this. And I mean non-traditional within the special collections environment. I liked what Brett had to say earlier about the purpose that people like us served and the idea of a bookstore like that being an ambassador. That's really what I want the Rare Books and Manuscripts Library and the Thompson Special Collections Unit um, to be to all comers for us. And what I mean exactly by that, we do this already through teaching and research support. We do this through um, kind of traditional outreach. But I really think Brett's collection, in contrast to say our really, really exceptional collection of medieval manuscripts, Brett's collection has a way to be significant to a living, breathing community that is at risk, on edge, and in a very crucial political moment right now. Um, one of the most pronounced moments in my career came when I was about 25 years old in graduate school pursuing my PhD and I was assigned to teach for the very first time not knowing what I was doing and learning on the fly. And I had a really, really gifted student. Never missed a class and constantly participated. You couldn't keep her quiet. It's one of those dream students. And she disappeared one week. She did not show up 
to any sessions. She didn't come to the one-on-one -on -one tutorial set that I had set up with her. I was very concerned, but didn't know what to do. And uh, about 10 days after her initial kind of disappearance, for lack of a better way of putting it, she appeared in my little study carol in the library and immediately burst into tears. And I didn't know what to do. And she told me she had gone home back to London, um, came out to her best friend who spat in her face, came out to her parents who at the moment disowned her, threw her out. And she effectively lived on the street for the better part of a week before coming back up to campus um, and deciding to get on with it. And she hadn't told anyone else up on campus about this. And for some reason, she felt that she could tell me. I don't know why. I was just her graduate student teacher. Um, and here I was, 25, barely older than this young woman. And I learned the power of creating space and just giving someone time to talk. And throughout the course of the rest of that term, she touched base with me. She got better. Things got a little bit better with her parents. But it was clearly something that changed her. She became a different person after this event. And I didn't have resources to give her. And when Brett approached me and as I've about this collection and as I've gotten to know Brett uh, better and seen what a great advocate and ambassador he is for this collection and how willing he is to support everything we do. Um, as that collection has continued to grow with Brett's help um, as uh, my colleague Jolie and I have applied this in different ways in the educational setting. I've really seen capacity to turn this collection into a community resource or something that outs and support research with it, but create something that my student back when I was 25 years old, maybe having a collection like this at her disposal would have helped her if I could have pointed her to it. Um, I really think that Brett's collection gives us a power as a special collection to do something that most special collection departments for whatever reason, aren't equipped to do or haven't thought about doing before. Um, and that's where I think the future for this collection really lies. Again, we're always going to be supporting teaching and research, but it's what can we do to help the community? And an area where I'm thinking about this, just to give you a current example, um, one of our community partners in Columbus, um, within the last six months, eight months, um, in a conversation, just let me know that Columbus has one of the highest HIV infection rates in the United States. I didn't know this. Um, and I immediately started thinking when, when he told me this about all of the zines and other books and other materials in Brett's collection that were created in response um, to personal experiences of people um, dealing with AIDS, whether a partner had it or whether they themselves had it at the height of the AIDS crisis. And although this is now you know, getting close to 35, 40 years old, some of these materials, um, this kind of stuff could really potentially impact the way that people here in Columbus who are dealing with this today in 2020, um, how they process their own situation. So I think our real challenge, we definitely have a willingness to get this material out there. It's how do we enact this collection in a real public facing way like this. And that's a challenge I'm really excited about and would love for people to, you know, contact me after this and send in ideas if you have um, suggestions about how to turn, you know, a stuffy rare books library into, you know, this ambassadorial kind of collection that is on a par with people like us back in the late 80s and early 90s. Well, thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. And I, I want to just say that, uh, to piggyback onto this, Julie, is that, you know, this collection is my legacy. I, I don't have kids. After I'm gone, after Eric's gone, I know that this library is going to preserve this material, and it's going to be around for future generations. And it's important for me to see this grow during my lifetime, to make sure that the material is preserved. We're currently in the process of endowing this collection. I think that there's going to be a, a link uh, in the chat about uh, the endowment itself. And, you know, I do want to recognize that there are wonderful institutions around the globe and throughout the United States, uh, some of whom I want to give a shout out to, most notably the Stonewall Collection in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, Carrie, who co-owned the bookstore with me, her collection, which as you can imagine is very similar to mine, will be housed at the Gerber Hart Library in Chicago, which is the oldest LGBT library in the country. 
And you know, I'm in dialogue with all of these other institutions. I'm thrilled, I'm happy that mine is housed at OSU, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't all communicate with one another and that we don't all share uh, information with one another, um, sometimes swap materials, which is great. So uh, check out uh, what's close to you. Maybe you're near uh, an institution uh, if you're further afield in Columbus and you want to access what they might have. have. And if I may, Julie, I'd like to, because this is about books, right? I would like to make a recommendation of a book that is currently on the New York Times bestseller list. It's the first LGBTQ book in 27 years to have that distinction. And it's called uh, The Deviant's War. And it's by uh, a man named Eric Cervini, C-E-R-V-I-N-I. I believe that there's going to be a link in the chat that has some of his resources that he accessed uh, during his research for the book. But this book is about uh, Frank Kemeny, who is an attorney. And during a period of time in the 1950s and the early 1960s, when we had what was called uh, the Lavender Scare. And if you were known to be homosexual, you lost your job. You could lose your housing. Um, you were disowned by your family. Kemeny was uh, Harvard educated. He was an astronomer. It was his desire to become an astronaut. He worked for the government. They found out that he was gay and he never worked again in his field. But he was the first person ever to appear before Congress um, on behalf of the homosexual and to, um, to lobby for, for gay rights uh, at the time. He was the first person to picket the White House specific to this community. And this book, The Deviant's War, is about Frank Kemeny and the early years. So I, I highly recommend it. Um, I think that there in the link will tell you how you can access it. And I'd like to just say in light of what's happening in the world and around us right now, that it, uh, we've got the anniversary, the 51st anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, uh, which happened in 1969. Uh, and that was uh, June 28th through the July 3rd of 1969. Those riots were not about marriage equality. Those riots were not about um, keeping your job. Those riots at Stonewall were against police brutality, okay? So draw those connections. Thank you, Brett, so powerful. And uh, I cannot believe that we are near the end of our time together. Brett, I feel this every time we see each other. Um, to, to close, if you could bring us, um, just tell us a little bit about what this journey has meant to you, having your collection come back home to Ohio, and, and what does it mean uh, to be speaking to our audience here today as we approach the end of Pride Month? Can you just share some reflections with us? Sure. Uh, I thank everybody for spending uh, an hour with us today about something that I think is important and is very near and dear to me. Um, it means the world to me. I'm glad that this not only has a home, but has the right home in the Ohio State University. And in working with Eric Johnson, it's been a dream come true. Uh, he gets it. And I feel supported. I feel heard. And I am really blessed that the collection is where it is. So thank you all. Great. Thank Hello. you, Brett. Thank you, Hello. Eric, for an engaging conversation. Eric, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'll follow up and say thanks to Brett. You know, you, you cannot uh, conclude a session like this without someone from the institution thanking Brett for making his way through his phone list and his call list and ultimately settling on Ohio State. And I am forever counting myself lucky that the phone rang that day. Um, your collections have really, really enriched the broad scope of things we do at Ohio State. And I really feel you should be applauded perpetually for that. 
round of applause. We're all giving a standing ovation. What an engaging uh, talk today. Thank you again. Uh, we're grateful to all of our audience members who joined us and we hope that you learned a little bit and were able to celebrate Pride Month um, by, by joining us and learning a little bit more about the LGBTQ collection here at Ohio State. We hope that you, um, that we do hope that we see you at some point in the near future when it's safe to do so. Please always come visit the archives. You have Eric Johnson's contact information there, which we will also email out. Um, and in the meantime, we hope that uh, we can stay connected virtually and that all of you stay, stay healthy and stay safe. Have a great afternoon. Some of these comments are very touching. Brett, you have so many fans here. A lot of your families here. <laughs> yeah, uh, right. If anyone's willing to hang on, we did have a, a question come through from J James Rydell. Sure, yeah, um, I'm happy to. James is wondering uh, if you have seen the documentary Circus of Books, and if you did, what did you think of it in general? Uh, you know, it's something I haven't seen yet. I intend to view it. Um, it's interesting that Circus of Books, which was in West Hollywood, was a, a porno shop, actually. They sold um, gay videos and gay magazines, which is uh, a little bit different than what we had at People Like Us Books. Um, but, um, you know, it was owned by a man and wife whose kids, um, really, I don't think knew exactly that their parents owned a pornographic bookstore. And so I am interested in watching that documentary. I have not seen it just yet. Something to look forward to. Wonderful. Um, I don't see any other questions that have come through, um, but thank you again to everyone who was able to join us.